here. All right, and I see people are joining in the background and we are recording this. So uh, we'll have it available on the website afterward for those uh, who either wanna rewatch it or were not able to attend live. But by way of introductions, I am Mark Vanderzeil. I work for Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures. I focus on working with entrepreneurs and startups and trying to connect them to resources, uh, be they mentors, industry sponsors and professional services or educational opportunities. This being one of the latter, and this panel series was originally envisioned by one of our mentors and residents, Dan Roach, who some of you know very well. And Dan was hoping to have people who've been there and done that speak from experience. You know, Sally's been uh, very instrumental in helping a lot of startups. Daniel and Gorka have been involved firsthand. And it's nice to be able to hear some best practices and maybe some mistakes to helpfully help people avoid potential pitfalls. The, the first four sessions we did earlier this year were kind of meant to, to focus on any industry, be they therapeutics or digital. Today, we're gonna to focus more on commercializing digital innovations to be a bit more narrow in the focus. But we were trying to hope we, we could explain to people what it's like to be a startup founder? What is that job description if there were a job description that existed? And how do you know when you're ready to take the leap? What does it take to plan, launch, and scale a successful organization? Who's been instrumental in helping you? And so I, I pulled together a panel today. I, I already alluded to a few of them. Sally Frank here's from Microsoft. She's the worldwide lead for health and life sciences in Microsoft for startups. We also have Gorkum Sivinch, founder and CEO of Qualytics, and Daniel Friedman, co-founder and co-CEO at Burnalong. Now I'm hoping each of you would be willing to give a brief introduction of yourself and, and your roles and your companies. So you start uh, with Sally first. Great, thanks Mark, and thanks for inviting me. It's nice to be here. Um, so as you said, uh, I lead our global program strategy and portfolio for Microsoft for startups focused on the health and life sciences industry. So I'm working with um, a top tier level of startups and helping them grow and scale both through technical excellence and vetting um, and confirmation of their architectures as well as go to market strategies and connecting them with our enterprise customers. Um, I've been enrolled for about two years, which is as long as the healthcare uh, industry team has been in, um, in place in the Microsoft for Startups program, which that program has been around for a very long time. Um, prior to joining, I was in IoT for healthcare, also working um, just by chance with uh, some startups there, just because it seems to be where some of the most interesting innovation in IoT is coming from. So uh, I've been at Microsoft for about seven years. Prior to that was with a Microsoft partner that was a startup when I joined. So um, yeah, I have a lot of experience going from um, very tiny companies to, uh, to large organizations like Microsoft. So look forward to the discussion and, and also learning from, from you guys. Thanks, Sally. Uh what you didn't mention, but I would be happy to mention is that you're also very involved with Fast Forward and yes. JHTV for the last few years. And that you know, the group just wrapped up office hours this morning and you and some colleagues make yourselves available on a regular basis to help uh, people uh, thinking about launching a startup or scaling a startup, uh, explore resources at Microsoft, give some advice, different other ways of support. So huge opportunity for people to take advantage of, uh, get in touch with me afterward if anyone's uh, looking for that engagement opportunity. I mean, next we'll go to Gorkum. Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks for having us, Mark. Sorry, Gorkum, uh, we're not hearing you, or I'm not. I heard him. Oh, you did? Yeah. How about now? Can you hear me now? I, I hear you. Yes. Loud and clear. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you, Mark, for having us on, on this panel. Uh, my name is Gorkim Savinch. I had an interesting career, uh, software engineer by trade, computer science degree from actually Hopkins. I'm a Hopkins grad, and I worked at Johns Hopkins for about eight years. That's when I met a number of you uh, first, uh, leading up the Technology Innovation Center. I always had an entrepreneurial itch that I wasn't scratching enough within Hopkins. Uh, that I uh, got outside of Hopkins to actually uh, do so 
the first startup that I did was a Johns Hopkins spinoff. Uh, we uh, spun off uh, uh, Emoka Health from uh, from Johns Hopkins. I was one of the co-founders there, uh, the CTO. Uh, after having grown Emoka, I wanted to see if I can translate my skills to another industry. I wanted to see if I can get away from healthcare a little bit. And uh, one thing led to another. I co-founded a little company called Facet Wealth, uh, again, as the CTO uh, for in the financial planning and wealth management space, again, in Baltimore, and scaled that from uh, four co-founders to about 350 people, um, post-series C and, uh, and scaling company. At the start of the pandemic, I had an idea for a, an automated data quality monitoring company. Uh, I saw the uh, firsthand I had experienced data quality as being an issue with, both within Johns Hopkins and all the other stops that I had along the way. And, um, and one thing led to another. I co-founded uh, Qualitix along with Dan Roach. You mentioned you mentioned Dan Roach. He is my co-founder. And, uh, and a few other people, and now we're off to the races. So I, sh I will be talking to Sally about how we can partner up as well. Good, that was not my intent today, but I'm glad. <laughs> and remind me, I haven't, I've sort of got a rough outline of where to, what things we can talk about today and things that were advertised for the participants who signed up, but I'd like to let the conversation kind of flow. And I, I don't want to presume, since that's why I brought you in, you guys are the experts. You've been there and done that. So I, I, I'd like you to steer this conversation. But you mentioned different industries there, both of you. And I, I'd be interested later when we talk about regulated industries, be they healthcare or fintech versus less regulated applications. And maybe that's as good of a segue as any to, to turn it over to Daniel Friedman. Hi there. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Daniel Friedman. I'm a co-founder, co-CEO of Burn along. Uh, apologies in advance for any background noise. I'm at the airport waiting, waiting for a light. This is a flight. This is the life of a of a of a startup founder. Um, my background: I started off as a journalist. I used to write for the Wall Street Journal and Forbes. I co-authored a New York Times top ten bestseller. I worked in policy in places like the United Nations. And then I spent five years in the intelligence world, working with governments around the world on their rehabilitation programs, and then a very personal journey with my late grandmother led me to co-found Burnalong um, for a digital health and well-being platform utilized by entities ranging from the U.S. government through to hospital systems through to employers across industries and Johns Hopkins is a client of ours so uh, we have a connection and we are here in, Bolt in Baltimore despite my accent um, and Johns Hopkins is also an investor in the company. And that's great, Daniel. And I think later I'd, I'd hope to talk about the M1 Ventures experience you had in Baltimore and how that was instrumental. But your colleagues were recently at one of our staff trainings and were telling me that there's a, a platform to work out with the trainer of Ray Lewis and Ed Reed for any Baltimore Ravens fans out there. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a Hall of Fame football player. I don't know if I could keep up. And they assured me that it's not all that elite caliber of, of courses. <laughs> um, one of the things that I wonder- uh, Want to hear, wanna hear how you do after going through that class? Yeah, <laughs> I think if you see me hobbling around in pain afterwards, you'll know I, I overextended myself. <laughs> uh, but I'm curious, uh, maybe we start with Sally, to get your thoughts on um, minimally viable products, MVP. I recently uh, was listening to a book where someone said, if you're not embarrassed by your first MVP, you waited too long. And I'm wondering if how you sort of balance that, of like when is it ready enough to kind of test the mark, test the waters versus how long do you tinker on something before you let anybody else see it? What's, what's your stance on MVPs? Yeah, so, um, you know, everyone's got to find kind of that sweet spot for themselves. But one of the things that I think is critical is to get prospective customers involved early so that um, as you're building the MVP, you don't come to them with a fully blown, fully baked MVP, but you identify two or three passionate people who are passionate about the problem that you're trying to solve and you get them involved from the very beginning, like this is our vision, this is our plan, what do you think? 
looks good. Okay. These are, this is the, the, the mock-up, if you will. It's not even MVP, but this is like the user experience. What do you think of that? Um, then we build out a little bit on the MVP and, and have additional checkpoints. So I think it's really incumbent upon the startup team to not wait, but to find those trusted advisors early. You know, maybe it's uh, Tech Ventures um, to get that feedback from prospective future users so that the MVP is never an embarrassment, but a true reflection of the market needs. Yeah, I think the, the author went on to say, now, I'm not saying you should be totally ashamed of your MVP, but maybe a little embarrassed, right? Warts and all, this thing's not perfectly polished, but let's get some, let's get some feedback. Uh, I see Gorkum coming off mute. Well, yeah, so uh, I've built a lot of MVPs within Hopkins and outside of Hopkins personally, and uh, couldn't agree more with what Sally is saying. My, you don't want to be heads down for a year building an MVP, and then you try to put it in front of somebody and they say, what did you do? <laughs> this is a lot. Uh, I've made that mistake personally, actually. The first startup that I had built was I was building it on the side, and um, we built for a year before we tried to go to the market. And it turns out we all were built. It turns out I wasted thousands of hours building a product that nobody was willing to buy. So, you know, one of the, one of the great programs that Hopkins has, yeah, Hopkins is a part of is, is the i program where it's helping people get out of the lab and I'm a big fan of it. And, you know, when I was building, when I was, when we were starting Qualytics, for example, we had an idea, we had a vision on how to approach data quality at scale. I cannot tell you how many CTOs, CIOs, heads of data that I have spoken to with simple mockups, with just the idea, with just getting feedback on what is the problem that they're facing? How are they facing it? What are the, what are the pain points that, I'm, that I would, I'm trying to optimize for? And then you start trying to get a feel for what, what would your product need to have in order, to, in order for them to be paying for it. The definition of MVP is it's a minimum viable product that somebody is willing to put money behind. You don't have to optimize the money. It can be a dollar, but that part doesn't matter as much, but uh, at least initially, but that they're willing to pay for it means significantly more than them trying to, them agreeing to play with a POC. POC meaning proof of concept. Um, and to Sally's point again, identifying early design partners is super important. You don't have to charge those design partners early on. If you can, great, but do what you can to find people that are passionate about the problem that you're solving and get them to give you feedback. We have, for example, we have three design partners that we work with very heavily. We have twice a week meet meetings with them. We are showing them product roadmaps. We're showing them the features that we're planning. We're getting their feedback on how they're using the product. So it's the most important thing you can do as you build a startup. You know, just to add on to that, and Daniel, I don't mean to cut you off, but, you know, we think about what we've learned about software development, and let's face it, this is still software development, even if it's health and life sciences. Nobody does waterfall development every, anymore. Everything's a sprint. Everything's agile methodology, you know, short amount of work, check in, short amount of work, check in. And this is the same that we've got, same kind of methodology that we've got to apply here. No, that's, that's great. And, and Gorkum, I appreciate the plug for i uh, one, of the, one of the programs that I am stewarding at, at Hopkins. So four times a year, we will take people through this process paired with a mentor to figure out if what you're working on is solving a critical problem in the market to where someone's willing to pay you for your solution. And that seems like a real oversimplification, but I think it's lost on some first time innovators or um, academics who haven't done a startup. That you can spend a lot of time developing something that no one's willing to pay for. And you wanna find that out early. And the good thing, one of the good things I think about software is that it's different than a therapeutic where you could spend many years and a lot of dollars in testing before you can try it out on a, on a person, right? You can't do that, but with software, you can, a little, a little lower risk there, but um, I'm curious, Daniel, what your thoughts are on, on when, when you're ready to show your baby to somebody else. I, I'd agree with what's being said, and I'd say you show your baby from when it's a piece of paper and find people for whom it's a problem that it resonates and they're willing to be 
an early adopter. I mean, just actually the, like the gentleman who you mentioned earlier, who's been on our platform actually from day one, who trained Ray Lewis, Ned Reed, and trains the Baltimore Ravens. We went to him as we were building it and said, look, this is our idea. This is what we're looking to do. Are you in? And you know that people, if you've really got a great idea, people are willing to get in on a piece of paper and people are willing to pay for it, partner with you, then you know you're really onto something. So I would say start selling from day one. And, you know, ideally, if you want people are willing to pay before you've launched, then you really know you've got, you've got a fit because the next piece is just, you're going to have to raise money. And as great and as shiny as something can look, the first question investors are going to ask is, who uses it? Who's paying for it? And if you don't have that, you're not going to get the terms that you want, if any terms. Daniel, if we could just stick with you. Or no, go ahead, Corey. Corey, come on. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to add something, but it's going to take us to a different direction, so I can okay. wait. No, I'm just curious if you can maybe elaborate a bit on how you went from idea stage to an actual MVP. Like, What, what are some of the steps, if you could summarize? So the steps that we that we took was number one is before we built before we built anything we had this concept on a, on a piece of paper and our concept was is that the vast majority of people in the country in the world don't do the health and well being programming that they need whether it's prenatal whether it's arthritis whether it's boot camps because they're not getting access to the right people and they don't have the social support to do it. And so the first thing that we did was we went to a number of trade shows where HR executives were, where medical associations were, where fitness partners were, the people who would be both sides of our marketplace and said to them, hey, this is our thesis. Does this resonate with you? What are you doing right now to solve for it? And if we started building this, would you be in? And that was like the core steps for us. And when we had like, yes, we'd be in, Yes, we'd pay for it. Yes, we'd partner with you. Then we knew we were, you know, we were onto something. So as we started building it, we already knew we had customers who were going to be willing to, who were going to be willing to pay for it. Gorkum, you're one of the people who's actually technically able to do this yourself. But you've worked through TIC at Hopkins with others who may have the idea. They may be a clinician or a, another role. But how do you how do you advise people who can't do the, the actual technical work themselves to partner with someone who can. This is me being technical. That's that's very technical. Um, it's a good question. So first of all, you know, you have to be very honest, honest, transparent feedback is very important with when it comes down to working with innovators that have an idea, but they are not technical, right? Um, they sometimes uh it's always two extremes they either oversimplify it hey it's just an app you just you just type a few things and magic happens that's not how software works and some of them oversimplify overestimate it we have to build all of the things under the sun because before it can be valuable to somebody then your vision is not uh tight enough in my in my humble opinion it's uh, one of the biggest things that I always advise people for is what is, again, the concept of minimum viable product or, um, you know, Google calls it minimum delightful product, uh, but that's a whole other thing. What is the minimum, what is the main core competency that you're trying to test here? And is that a viable business when you license it out? And one of the, one of the things that we ran into the most was it's a thing that is going to work great for Hopkins nobody else is going to buy it. We made that mistake a lot, and I'm sure you have seen it a lot, right? It's a Hopkinsism because, because it's very specific to our, uh, our ecosystem. So giving advice on that as a technical founder is um, it's tricky. And one of the things that we have always done is actually before we write a single line of code, Let's go through design thinking exercises. Let's go through putting prototypes together, putting designs together, and talk to people that are not your colleagues. I don't want to hear from your colleagues. I want to hear from your your secondary connections at another in, 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 at another institution that are facing the same problems. Um, one quick point that I wanted to make, Mark, before we move on from the MVP sure. uh, part is 
we have talked about engaging people early. Um, a couple points of advice there is number one, do not over optimize to one person's feedback. You will always have one person that is very loud, that has very strong opinions. Talking to one person is never enough. Talk to many, many people at the same time, gather their feedback, uh, cultivate their feedback to see what your product roadmap, your product MVP needs to look like. And um, and I had a second point and it totally escaped me. So I'm going to stop there. No, no, that's okay. Because it, it was on one of my follow-up questions is, is the customer always right? Right. How do you incorporate feedback so you don't have blinders on and you're not ignoring it, but sometimes you have to be a bit selective right, about what feedback is helpful and builds your platform versus isn't. Daniel, I uh, see you've got some well, Yeah, well, I mean, it's the, the famous line from Henry Ford, right? Where he said, if I, if I gave people what they want, they'd ask for faster horses. So yeah. part of that is the, the why methodology of understanding why they have this problem and like just going to several levels deeper to, to understand that. Sally, do you have thoughts about how people should incorporate early user feedback no, I mean, it's it, the only thing that I would add is that we have the internet. There's so much information out there that if you get guidance that seems a little bit off, you know, there are all kinds of industry reports and research things that you can look at and go, okay, this seemed a little odd to me. Let me look and see if others are saying the same thing or looking at the same thing. So I think we, we you know, build this um, set of trusted advisors, but there's really quite easy ways of just going online and adjudicating whether or not the trends that they're seeing are ubiquitous or unique to them or somewhere in between. So um, nothing is done in a vacuum and, and no single source of information is going to be sufficient if you're gonna hit the mark on uh, bringing something to market that's really gonna be successful. And adding to Sally's point, please uh, understand the competitive landscape. Yes. Look at what all the other solutions are doing. There are so many times that I've had people come to me with an idea and they want to build the next iPhone or they want to build the next Altoids and it already exists. What is your moat? What is the thing that is that makes it very special for you to be dominating that market? And that my, always... my, my favorite line is we don't have any competitors. Oh yeah, of course not. Yeah, and 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 my response to this is your customers doing nothing is competitive. Because to do what you want them to do and buy your solution, there's change management, there's training, there's all kinds of other things and it is much easier to do nothing. So even if you think you don't have competitors, which obviously you do, at a minimum doing nothing is your is your chief competitor. That's good. Um, Sally, if I could just stay with you for one second, can you um, maybe tell people about some of the design architecture resources um, that, that your team has for those who maybe need to learn how to fish themselves? So you teach somebody how to fish rather than giving them a fish? Sure. So through uh, the Microsoft for Startups program, um, you do get access to our Azure support teams. So, you know, you have a bug, you have a problem, you know, they're able to help. We also have loaded Founders Hub, which is kind of the nexus of our program and where everyone um, gets their uh, credits and information and all that. There's a bunch of both technical and business development training in there. So that if you are, um, you know, coming up and running on um, a solution and maybe, migrating from AWS or starting from scratch. There are multiple resources in there that will get people started. And I will say that as you go through our program and go from ideation to MVP to product market fit, we actually have additional resources that open up as you get to those major milestones. Because one of the things that we're trying to do at Microsoft for Startups is to help startups at every step of their journey. And what you need at ideation is very different than what you need at MVP. So through that program, through Founders Hub, there are a ton of resources and more being added every day that help startups at various stages of their journey, regardless of what industry. So we've got 
Um, we've got uh, startups from all industries. I just focus on health and life sciences. Does that answer your question, Mark? Yeah, it does. And I, I this is you know a plug a bit for the non-technical innovators at maybe Hopkins, right? Who say, I have this idea, but who can I partner with to help bring it to fruition? And what are some of these resources? We have some internal, we have some external. Um, I just, I was hoping you'd, you would mention that. So thank you. Uh, one of you mentioned a moat or building it, you know, I, I've heard that strategy about protecting your competitive advantage. I'm wondering, maybe we start with Gorkum on this one. How do you, how do you sort of build, you know, protect your, your idea, your, I, if it's not a traditional like patent and license track to market, or if it's more a know-how or a talent or a skill set or a first mover, like, can you speak to some of those ways that you can protect your advantage? Yeah, the, the way I like to think about it in this, in the, at least in the software world is I don't mind my competitors knowing my product roadmap. I really don't like I don't have to hide it because if they don't have a robust enough product roadmap that they're stealing ideas from me, I'm going to go, I'm going to run faster than them anyway. Being first on market, of course, is advantageous and disadvantageous at the same time. Investors will be like, what is it that you build? Like, are people gonna pay for it? Or if you have too much competition, then they're going to say, How are you different from all the players in this field? How does that work? So when we think about a moat we think about what is it that you do that is different from everybody that is your, your special sauce. It can be methods. It can be a piece of algorithm that you have written. It can be a, um, it can be the way you conduct your business. It can be something about uh, something that is not protectable by patent law, right? It's, it's a copyright of, on a software. But when you're starting an MVP or when you're building your MVP, when you're scaling your MVP to the real first level product, you always want to, to keep in mind, what is my mode and, and how do I keep having it as a mode? Of course, my, my, my always, my, uh, uh, reservation is always that I have an idea, I have a moat, I'm building it. And at the same time, some few few people go from through Y Combinator, all of a sudden they have millions of dollars. They don't even have a product yet, they, but they have a similar moat and they are now much better funded to build the same thing. So that's something to always watch out for. Um, but from the protective perspective, you know, I, I, there are a bunch of people from JHTV here. So, you know, I'm not going to say that I don't believe in patents. Of course, I believe in patents and uh, and protecting the IP. But there is something to be said about trade secrets, copywriting the software, and thinking about methods more so than just an algorithm that I sell. Yeah, that's helpful, Garf. And I, from colleagues that I've spoken to, there's that same approach, right? You know, patent isn't the be all end all way to commercialize innovation. There's times where it makes sense and times where there's other ways. And Daniel, I'm curious if you could speak to, you know, your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, right off the, off the bat, you're not gonna have too much of a moat, right? You're, you're building it, you're having to take your ideas to people, you're, you're pitching it. You can build up the moat in a number of ways over time. Um, but ultimately I agree with Gorkum, like it doesn't matter if your competitors have your roadmap, you, know, you should have the belief that you're gonna be maniacally focused on this and do it and do it better than them. And if the industry is big enough, there's not gonna be one winner, there are gonna be multiple winners and multiple ways for people to make this you know, make money. But if, if I had a dollar early on for every time an investor said, what happens if Google can do what you're doing or Microsoft can do what you're doing or Facebook can do what you're doing, I would have had a healthy exit already at this, you know, at this point with amount of money, money for that. The, the answer to it is that they've got a hundred different, a hundred thousand different things that they're, that they're focused on. And we're going to be maniacally focused on this and we're going to do it. We're going to do it better. How have you focused on sort of that stickiness of, of burn along and, and retaining users and building that sort of passionate uh, customer base? listening and watching what the customers do so both things that they're aware that they're doing and things that they might not be aware that they're doing or things we might not have thought of initially um, like we think about it for example when we originally much more physical 
wellness focused. And then some people were coming to us, but we partner with hospitals for programming for people with cancer. And they're starting to take cardio classes. Then they're hearing instructors talking about nutrition or they start searching for insomnia. The one things that we've heard off the bat, but then we thought, okay, all right, we need to think about this um, horizontally and add insomnia classes and nutrition classes and thinking about paying pharmacy bills. And we were seeing that not necessarily for, necessarily from what the hospitals were telling us, but what from users were actually searching for on the platform. So watching and, and listening to what users are doing, and it goes back to what is the problem that they are trying to solve. So for us, it's multiple problems, right? One person could be trying to solve their, their, own, their own health and wellness. For someone else, it's about a loved one. And they've got a parent who's the other side of the country who's dealing with Parkinson's disease or arthritis or MS, or they've got a sibling who, who's struggling to lose weight. How are you helping them support the people that they love? So understanding the different problem sets that you're helping them solve and then thinking about what are the best ways to do it. And I don't, I'm not sure how to segue into this topic. I'll try my best, but how is, I'm wondering if you guys can talk about, talk about different industries, right? I mentioned this earlier, you know, digital health or things that are touching on like electronic medical records versus FinTech and another set of protected data versus users, you know, even, you know, Daniel, I'm sure there's, there's some protected information there and that trust and data integrity and maybe you guys can just speak of how you've thought about that, you know, what's regulated, what we, you know, what we have to do to protect our brand reputation, our customers, users, external regulators, putting things on you. I don't know if, if that makes sense, if we can kind of talk about that as a. Yeah, I mean, just to get off, so for us, it's, there's privacy guidelines, so whether it's HIPAA, whether in Europe it's GDPR, so those are all things that you have to write up front, it's one of the most critical things, so protect people, meet regula regulatory requirements and protect people's data and privacy, so for us, that was a bar right up front that we had to do, I mean, I, I would view one of those things as being the non-negotiables in the same way that you have to use the correct legal documents, you have to get your, your business set up properly, um, taxes, those are just table stakes to do that correctly. Yeah, so, one of the, of oh, course, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, one of the things that I try to impress upon the startups that I work with is to make sure that your product development roadmap, you go to market strategy and your regulatory roadmap are all in alignment and that at every stage of the development of your product, that you're also looking at what regulatory hoops do I have to jump through and when do I start that process and how is this going to affect my go-to-market strategy? And so I see a lot of folks building solutions and then going, okay, now we're going to get it. Now we're going to go to the FDA or now we're going to get, you know, the, the CE mark. And it's like, no, you should have been planning for that since day one so that they were, they were processes running in parallel that also align to how you're gonna be able to go to market. For example, there are sometimes even before, you know, uh, FDA approval, you can do trials, you can do tests, you can do things that allow you to kind of nudge up to that go to market without going full blown because you're in testing mode. But if you don't think about that until you're done with the product or have your first MVP, you've lost time and you've lost possibly competitive edge. So those three work streams have to be inextricably linked from day one so that you can continue to grow and, and push your product through uh, across all three of those um, vectors at the same time. Go ahead, Corbin. Very similar thoughts. So first of all, for God's sake, please understand FDA and NDA, uh, sorry, uh, NDA, FDA and HIPAA and GDPR do some basic research to understand what data privacy, data security looks like. And if you think that you're going to take a Hopkins innovation and you're going to sell it to a Mayo Clinic, a um, Cleveland Clinic, it's not that easy. <laughs> so I don't want to scare anybody here, but you, have, you are now responsible for managing the security and privacy of that data. Because if you get hacked, 
guess what's going to happen? You are the one that is actually on the hook, not Mayo Clinic. You are the one on the hook because you are the steward of the data. Um, the same thing applies to financial services. Financial services has its own you know, set of privacy security uh, regulations that have to be followed. A lot of what you got to understand, with especially with the data security privacy side, is that a lot of what's being requested is best practices. But you need to understand the law. You need to understand that, you know, is the product that I'm building going to deal with a lot of sensitive data? And am I planning on, uh, you know, in my product roadmap, just like Sally said, am I planning on managing that in an appropriate fashion? Um, I, am I trying to expand to expand to Europe? You need to you need to think about all of these as part of your data data privacy security. We go through a lot of uh, due diligence with large enterprises. We're talking Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, and it's taxing on a startup. So you need to also think about where do I start first when I'm not whale hunting, because it is whale hunting at the end of the day. And one and one more point that I want to make is with the with the uh, ecosystem that we live in with platforms and infrastructures as a service, such as Microsoft, AWS, Google, there are best practices that can be followed that are provided by infrastructure as a service to make your to make it easier for us to build HIPAA compliant or GDPR compliant applications. So understand that before you start building. Yeah, thanks. That's one of the things I was thinking of and hopefully trying to segue toward was, you know, could this be part of your competitive advantage that you're a, you're a trusted resource, you're a trusted vendor when you're trying to sell into a large employer like Burnalong maybe, or where you're trying to integrate with an electronic medical records of a big health system, they need to know that you're serious and that they can allow you into that inner circle. Um, how, Sally, how do you guys, you know, address that? I know there's a lot of ways, but that sort of data integrity, that compliance. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting, you know, Gorkum started with, you know, no GDPR, no HIPAA. And one of the other things that you need to know is whatever software platform you're on of the big three, make sure you understand what their offerings are in this area. We have a whole set of health uh, data services that are specifically designed for integration with FIRE, DICOM, you know, so many things that startups, if they don't know about it, they'll try and build it themselves. And so, um, and a lot of that encompasses what the Microsoft Cloud, how we cover HIPAA, how we cover BAAs and, and other kind of privacy mechanisms that are in place. So it's not only that you have to understand what the industry requires, you have to understand what your cloud vendor offers and where you can basically build on services and know that these things are meeting the requirements and where you have to focus on your specific efforts to make sure that your solution is compliant as well. So, you know, and, and I would say, you know, if you're, if you're not security experts, hire one whether it's a company or an individual. Um, but, you know, we've all been watching what's going on with Common Spirit. You do not want to be them or be uh, anywhere associated with having your solution be part of that, um, that issue. So, you know, it, it is probably tantamount to getting it up and off the ground and also being credible with your target customers. Thanks. Daniel, it looked like you had something to add. Yeah, a, a slightly different point just to pick up on something that Gorkum said, uh, which I think is important to emphasize, which is you are going to go well hunting, but they are unlikely to be your first clients. So you've got to find the smaller, more nimble people who are suffering your pain point and they want to partner with you right now. You're just going through procurement alone at one of these large companies, one of these wells, is going to take you months and months of time and the resources, uh, how what's been said, it's just going to drain you. So, you know, you might have like a warm introduction to Microsoft or to someone else, but make sure you've got, think about the amount of time that's going to take you in resource wise versus other smaller people who can move more quickly. And then they're going to provide you that data that a Microsoft or a Google is going to want to anyway see before they're willing to go on you because they're unlikely to be the first ones 
to, to back on you. Yeah, um, and if I can add on to that, one of the things that we talk about is um, going, you know, having those big whales in kind of your aspirational, but what can you work on and what can you win today? And then with some of these smaller organizations, what concessions can you give them so that they're kind of in an early adopter phase in exchange for a customer story, a blog post, a press release, you know, so exchange kind of the, the lower cost, basically higher risk of being an early adopter for the impending publicity that you can get to win the bigger customers later on. That's great. Daniel, I remember years ago at M1 Ventures that I think it was the, the culmination event, Paul was talking about the speed of how large organizations move compared to startups. And he said, it's sort of like trying to swat a fly. Like you think you're moving fast, but to this fly, it's incredibly slow. And I thought that was a really good analogy. And you're right. Like the time it takes a large organization to make a decision and make a purchasing decision is likely a lot longer than a startup would like or expect. And so I'm wondering, Daniel, if that's a good opportunity for you to talk about that experience in M1 Ventures and some of the things you learned or some of the, the benefits of going through a program like that. My understanding is it was focused on sort of scaling customer growth and sales as opposed to sort of ideation and launch, but maybe you can correct me or elaborate on that. Yeah, I think the, the, the big value of um, M1 or different programs is I think like twofold. One is you're just with a group of peers. You also understand being starting a company can be pretty lonely. It can, you know, you often think that the wall is, the walls are constantly falling in. This is never going to work. When you see that there are other people at the same stage as you, you know, I wouldn't say a case of misery loves company. I think it's like a, that collective, collective wisdom, that collective support. It's like, okay, well, we're all going through this. Let's exchange ideas. Let's speak to the mentors who've seen it hundreds of more times. Like Sally, and I'm sure in your two years, you know, you can have a match like crazy. So it's not like, oh gosh, this is a problem that no one had before. Someone's trying to Sally and she said, well, I've seen five companies do this. Here are the three different things they tried. Here's the, here's the piece that worked out best. And so it's like that pattern matching that can be incredibly helpful. So it's both the two pieces I'd say the value is, is having that cohort with you where you can share ideas, having, having, having mentors who can pattern match and give you advice. And then of course, more broadly, there should be introductions, whether it's to investors, whether it's to potential, potential clients, um, and I'd say in general, in general advice, I think one of the best pieces of advice that we got was just other, well, where we started with was start selling early, right? Start selling, show that people will buy. A lot of people think like, let's just focus on our technical team, uh, not to disrespect Gorkum in any way, but I think the sales team, you've got to stop up, stop up pretty quickly. And that's like Gorkum that you're doing the sales yourself as well. But you really got to stop up the sales team and, 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 set, and sell. I'm a sales guy now. I'm not a technical guy anymore. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you. Um, just to add to what Dan said, um, we, we actually just graduated from a program down in Atlanta called Engage that is backed by 15 corporate partners. These are the big Atlanta names that are VCs into this fund and they make an investment into the startup and, uh, and you get sort of tailored introductions to uh, each of these corporates. So I'm talking names like Coca-Cola, Invesco, Georgia Pacific, uh, really, really big names, Delta, right? We are getting, so think about it this way. They are investors in the fund that is an investor in us. So essentially they're sort of an investor in us, right? right? They have vested interest in our success. Even then, it has been months do, I couldn't answer you right now to say, you know, do I have a signed uh, contract with any of them? I have a lot of interest. I'm talking to a lot of the uh, buyers and getting a lot of interest, but it's a very, very slow moving vehicle. Uh, and that's how corporates are, right? And that's, that, that's just how it is. I mean, I've been on the Hopkins side as the buyer and we were the ones that were slow because we have to go through so many hoops before we can make such a decision. So to Dan's point, um, there, there's a great um, um, there's a great movie called Glengarry Glen Ross, and if you haven't watched it, 
It's Go great. watch it. It's the best movie ever. And it's all about uh, selling real estate. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 it teaches you your ABCs. ABCs always be closing, right? You always got to be selling, and you don't even know. Like you may be sitting next to somebody on a train, and it turns out they have a cousin who's doing what, and you make a connection. These things happen a lot, so you always got to be closing. But to Dan's point. Close with the, the ones that are going to move fast. Is it like a mid-market, upper mid-market customer that could buy quicker? They don't have to go through 10 committees before they make a decision. Get the critical mass, work out the kinks of your product with them, and then uh, and then you start scaling into the, the people on the fortune lists. Yeah, if I can add on to that, there are a couple of points that, that both Daniel and Gorka made that... Um, I want to underscore. So one of them, when we think about always be selling, um, one of the things that I see frequently is people waiting too long to look for investments or to make connections with VCs. And I think one of the things that startups need to think about, even if they're not ready for a full funding cycle, to start identifying VCs that they think match their mission and start making connections because people are more likely to make connections when it's like, no, I don't need any money. Not at all right now. I just want to make a connection and get to know you a little bit because a, a VC investment is a marriage. And so the longer that relationship and the more fruitful it is without asking for money, the more beneficial it will be. And maybe that's not the VC that invests in you, but by the time you generate that relationship and build, build trust, they will have other people that they might be able to bring your way. Um, so I think the whole notion of being stealth, um, I, I cringe when I hear that, oh, we're in stealth mode. Okay, basically you feel like you have no competitive advantage, uh, you're not committed and um, you don't have any customers. That's what stealth means to me. Um, so, so I think that whole phenomenon needs to go. You need to be selling at every moment and the final thing I'll say on the always be always be closing is have your elevator pitch down like Pat. So you think about I've got a couple of startups that um, are in this whole like Web3 thing, and I ask them what what they do and they spew like three pages worth of detail about what they do verbally. And I'm like, no, no, no. I need 17 words in seven seconds that tell me what you do and why I should care. That, that's good. Uh, I'll save my my thoughts on that for later. <laughs> but you gotta uh, be able to explain your company to your mother-in-law who's not technical. Well, yeah, I, I'm. That's sorry, what I. Did. I feel like I feel like blockchain is is the dot com of of our time right now. You know, just throw it on the end of whatever your idea is, and but that's not the the, the whole. Pitch. No, and, and and most people don't care what technology is behind it. They want to know this problem that you're solving and the technology behind it will come later. But tell tell me what you do that will move the needle for my business. Yeah. Uh, just, I, I, I'd say like, you, you never know where you're going to meet people. So I'm, I'm now in an, in an airport. Uh, one of my investors, I, I ended up just sitting next to him on a flight, I was traveling with my baby. I asked him to hold the baby because I was trying to like move stuff around. We start chatting, start talking about the problem, and you just you, you really never know where you where you meet people. I think to echo to Sally's point is the advantage of on the investor side of meeting them early when you're not raising is both um, them getting to know you, but just as critically, like Sally said, it's a marriage and you getting to know them. You know, you get the more you spend time with someone, the more you know their personality, the more you're going to know, like, how are they with you in good times and in challenging times, because there are always challenging times. And so you really want to understand, like, their, you know, their personalities as well. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I always think of startup founders as constantly in, in sales mode, regardless. You're selling to your hires, you're selling to investors, you're selling to customers, you are constantly trying to compel somebody why what you're doing is going to be worth it for them and that they should join on board. But what one of the advantages, again, of, of digital innovations is that you can build your company through both revenue and investment. I think a lot of companies that we deal with are pre-revenue for a long time. So as you know, you guys have all already addressed something I was going to ask about, like, how do you scale an organization through both 
bootstrapping and investment, right? Um, Gorkum, do you have something to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, th there is a whole philosophical discussion that can go into investors and investments. I, I totally agree with what Dan and Sale are saying with, uh, you know, it's when you are, when you're taking money from somebody, you're essentially saying that you're now my boss, right? Because in one way, shape or form, you need to treat them with your fiduciary responsibility of doing the right thing with their money. And it's, it's one of, if you look at the more successful companies, a lot of those have um, founders having stake in the game, not just from the sweat equity perspective, but monetary perspective as well. doesn't matter what the amount is. It can be $500, but that you are putting your means into the company as well. And don't raise money early. Don't do it too early. Don't do it too late. The, the, the markets that we're living in is weird. 2020 and 2021 were an anomaly. Now everything is coming crashing down hard, as you all know. And um, the, in 2022 or 20, oh, sorry, in 2021, you could have an idea that would get a $4 million investment on 20 million post money valuation because VCs have too much money to give out. Good luck with that today. That's not going to happen, right? We're back to sort of more of a normalcy. Uh, but that being said, you should familiarize yourself with what investments, what, what are the times, the right times to go after an investment is. What does a family and friends or like a pre-seed round look like? What does a seed round look like? When do you do a series A? Um, what are the contract vehicles that you should be utilizing? Familiarize yourself with like Y Combinators, best practices. I've been burned by that before personally. So, um, you know, it's if I were to give any advice to any co-founders here, you know, learn those early and and build relationships with the investors, just like Sally and Dan said. I um, It's a marriage and you're in it for the long haul. A startup exit is 10 years. It takes 10 years. You're signing up to it. 10 year relationship. If you have a good relationship with your investor, when you start your next company after that, they're going to be the first money in. So Gorkum, you can give advice. This is exactly the forum for it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering in our, our final few minutes here together, Daniel, what's one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you started Burn Along? It's like a country music song that I, um... I'd probably come back to just ramping up sales earlier and we, and we did it, but I think we could have just done it earlier. I think that's the key, probably the biggest, the biggest thing to me, what I, if I could go back, what I would, what I would do, but um, there's like hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of lessons along, along the way, but uh, as a, as a founder, you're naturally an optimistic an optimist and you're looking forward rather than, rather than back. So I'd say sales is a big thing. Sally, what's what's sort of a common thing that you wish startup founders knew? So I'm going to go and add something to what Daniel was saying. Um, one of the things that I see is uh, startups giving their pitches because we're we're connecting them to prospective customers. Mm -hmm. And I have one startup, one out of all the ones that I work with that will end it with, and here's how you buy, and here's what it will cost. We did this cost model for you uh, based on what we know about your organization. And it's the same every time, but they pretend that it's unique to that organization. Um, but the idea about you know asking for the sale, letting people know how to buy your product. I mean, basically what I see most frequently is, here's what we do, we think we can help you, silence. So then the prospective customer is like, well, it's kind of cool. How do, how do I buy it? What's your business model? Is it SaaS? Am I going to pay by user? Am I going to pay a monthly subscription? All that needs to be really crisp and ferreted out in a way that will make your investors happy so that they can see where, where they're going to make their money back. But you've got to be prepared to have people buy. You've got to be prepared for success. I think so many startup founders are so used to knocking on doors and getting no's that when they get a yes or maybe, they're not, they're not sure how to act. That's good. Be optimistic. I'll, I'll always ask. You don't get if you don't ask. 
That's right. And have it ready. Have your business model ready. Let them know how to buy. Even if it's just a POC, hey, we'll, we'll start with a 25K POC, whatever it is, but be ready. Gorkum, what, what lessons and wisdom have you gained? Uh, you wish you knew? Just like Dan, I could write a book probably. Um, the, <laughs> you have to be open to, I remembered my earlier point that I'm going to make now. Um, you cannot be offended by somebody calling your, your child ugly. They will. But trust me, they will. It's going to happen. And you got to have tough skin. And that's, that's the most that's, valuable feedback, actually. It is. If you get a bunch of people that go, oh, this is great. This is great. You've learned nothing. Exactly. Number two is do not shy away from parting ways with people that you have started the company with or are working for the company. It's one of the bigger mistakes that I have done where I waited too long or I have uh, given second and third and fourth and fifth chances to people. And you have to be cutthroat, right? Um, in a startup environment, it's, you know, it's time is your biggest enemy. So you cannot waste time with uh, people that are not producing and, you know, uh, parting ways with a co-founder is okay. That's absolutely okay. Um, yeah, we, those, we've talked about that before. You know, getting people on your team is hard, but you should also be ready to get people off. Yeah. Um, Cor one, actually, maybe one more thing just to briefly add is just remember, and this goes back to the point we were discussing earlier on where you're spending your time and going after the whales and like Corkman's point on how long it's taking even with groups that are investors in him. Remember, anytime you're saying yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And you've got limited time. So think about it from, from that perspective. So Daniel, let's just stick with you. Who has been the most helpful for you? If you were single out one resource. Uh, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky. Like who's tricky your favorite one. child, Daniel? Which one? Pick one. <laughs> I, I, I think like the answer is there's no there's no one. Or, or what resources have been have been particularly helpful? Yeah. Um, I'd say some of our early investors have been incredibly helpful um, in pushing us to think about different things. Some of our very first clients um, have been incredibly helpful. Um, founders and startups who are a couple of steps ahead of us have been incredibly helpful. There's like a whole a whole list of people along the way who've been very, very helpful and go to for, go to for different pieces of, of advice. And I think that's what you really need to know is like in different scenarios, get back to the pattern matching piece of who can you go to, right? So if you're maybe some early stage meetings, you know, Sally might say, well, that's, I'm, you know, I'm the best person for it. If you're going through some complex funding negotiations and you want to make sure you're not burned by certain terms, that's something Gorkum referenced. Maybe you're going to Gorkum for that. So. Think about who's the best people for advice for different challenges. So I've got I've got probably about 15 different people who I would call any time during a month, just depending on what challenge I'm dealing with. And I'd say they're all incredibly, incredibly helpful. Okay. Gorkum, any particular resources you'd like to I, I so I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat what Dan said uh, in maybe a little bit different words. I personally have I'm all about building my network and growing with my network and also with my, uh, I love mentorship. I love getting advice and I have people that are previous investors that are still mentoring me because I have built such an amazing relationship and I value their advice. There's, it's impossible to call one, one person out. It's, uh, it's more like it takes a village, but, um, but some of my early investors who are actually, you know, former C level executives that, you know, Fortune 100 companies are the best people that are giving advice and being in the advisory board of the company, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes a village, but, um, you know, just like Dan, I have a role of Excel people that I call on. And Sally, I suppose I should, other than you, who have you seen who's been particularly helpful to startups that you're working with? So I, I do see, you know, some really strong relationships between um, the VCs and their and their startups and, you know, um, the the 
constant, um, not just financial support, but you know, gaming out the go-to-markets and helping them with additional resources because they're trying to protect their investment. So I think sometimes, you know, we think of VCs as just being kind of the, the bank accounts, but I would say if you are actively working with your VC in a productive way, they're going to provide much more than just a check. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I've always hopefully left people wanting more at the end of these panels. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time on the panel and the participants in the background. So thank you, Sally, Daniel, and Gorkum for your time today. I know you're all very busy. I really appreciate you giving back uh, with your expertise and your time today. For everyone else, there will be more installments of these series going forward as we focus on different topics. And we have some recordings that are available from previous sessions. Uh, so. Reach out to me if you can't find them on our website, but they will be out there. Thanks, everyone. Daniel, I hope you have a safe and productive trip. And thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you all. Bye-bye.